This is how to use the JavaScript Fetch API to gather and display data from an external source, like these usernames from the JSON placeholder API. We're also going to learn how to send data, like creating a new user, update data, like updating a user's address, and delete data, like deleting a user entirely. Starting off, I have an empty project here in VS Code, and I have the JSON placeholder.typeycode.com website open. This is the free fake API that we're going to be using to test in our code. You can find a link to that in the description. The first thing I'm going to do is open the Explorer. I'm going to create a new HTML, index.html. I'm going to write exclamation mark, and that's going to give us a boilerplate code. Under the title, I am going to link to a script, and we're going to say that we're going to defer that script to run it after the body. It is just going to be called script.js. And in the body, I am going to create a paragraph and I'm just going to give that an ID of P. We're going to insert the data we receive into that paragraph later on. Then I'm going to open the Explorer. I'm going to create that script file script.js. I'm going to open it and I'm just going to log here a test to see that everything is running smoothly. Next, I'm going to use the live server extension to run this code locally so that when I save, we are going to get the new changes automatically. Now, if I open the inspect tab and I go to the console, we see that test is successfully logged. So how do we get some data from an API? Well, we're going to go to JSON placeholder. We're going to just copy this URL. Then in my code, now I'm going to use the fetch function that is inbuilt into JavaScript. And here we can see that it takes two arguments. It takes input and init. Input is mandatory and init is optional. And we're going to get back to that one later. The first argument is going to be simply the URL that we just copied. So we're going to paste that in there. And then if we switch back to our project, our URL that is running locally here, and we open the network tab. And now when I'm saving this project, we see that I am actually making a network request here. If I click on this JSON placeholder, we see that the request URL is the one that I have typed into my code. We also see a status code 200. OK, status codes come in ranges in the 100s. It means that the requests have been received and it's a continued process in the 200 ranges. It means that it was successful, received, understood and accepted in the 300s. Further action needs to be taken to complete the request. Status codes in 400 means that it's a bad syntax somewhere and the request can't be fulfilled. And you'll get 500 something if the server failed to fulfill a valid request. In this video, 200 and 400 is going to be the relevant ones. Here I am on the header tab of this request. And if I scroll down, we see that we have a lot of info here. We don't need to worry about that. But the things we do need to pay attention to is the request URL. The request method that we see here is get. By default, fetch sends a get request, and we are going to learn how to send another type of request later on in this video. If we then click the preview here, we see that we get actually the whole uh, HTML website from this URL. If we click the response, we see the HTML. How now do we actually use this data in our code? If we switch back to JSON placeholder, I would like to now get the users. JSON placeholder comes with a set of six common resources. We can have posts, comments, photos, and users. If we click this, we actually see this is the data that they make publicly available to anybody who wants to experiment with this API. So I would now like to display the name of each user on my website. How do I do that? Well, as we can see here in the URL here, we need to add slash user to the fetch method. So we're going to add slash users, hit save, and then switch back to our document. We see now that we have made a users request. And if we go on the response, we see that we actually get all the users that we have displayed in the same way on the actual URL. If we look into the preview, we see that we have all the user data here. So now we would assume we could just console log this, for example, and we would see the data on our page or in our console. So let's try that. So now I'm going to console log this fetch request, and I'm going to tidy up the code a bit like so. And now we would expect to see the same data in our log as we have here in the response. Hitting save, and we see in the console log, we have something called a promise. If we open it up, we see that we have 
prototype, promise, promise state, and promise result. Now, what we are actually looking for is in the promise result here, but we are not able to access it the same way we can by just clicking into the network tab here. And the reason is that promise is something we receive as a confirmation from the server that yes, you have sent a request and you will get something back, but at the time that you have received this promise, you don't have the data yet. So a promise holds a future value that we can access once that we have received all the data that we want. You can think of it as when you're downloading a file, it needs some time depending on the size of the file before you can actually access that file. So here we are simply sending a request to access a bit of text, which takes not a lot of seconds. It takes even, let's see in the network tab here, we can see exactly how much time it takes. If we go into the timing tab here, it took a total of 19.8 81 milliseconds. The reason that we are getting that data back as a promise is because our code runs faster than that. Our code runs immediate. So if we would now to try to access this data inside of the promise, we would access it much faster than the 39.39 .39 milliseconds here. So it would not work. We would try to access some data before we actually receive the full data set. So this is why promises come into play. It's simply an object that represents the eventual completion or failure of an async operation. And the cool thing with promises is they provide a way to handle the result of the async operation once the operation is complete. If we click here on the prototype, we see that we have a then, we have a catch, and a finally. And we are going to be using the then and the catch shortly. If we close the prototype, we also see that it has a promise state, which is equal to fulfilled. Now, as long as you don't have some server issue or like a network issue, you are always going to get fulfilled back, even if you actually write the URL wrong. So now I'm going to write just like a bunch of numbers here. I'm going to save and we see that we get a get 404, which means that the request contained the bad syntax, obviously. But still, if I inspect the promise here, we see that it is fulfilled. So the fulfillment of the promise is separate from the result of the data that you are asking for. Because here you successfully sent request, it's just that the request URL is wrong. So then let's revert our code back to the actual correct users. Now we have a promise. So how do we actually get a hold of the usernames? So we want to be going into the response here. In order to do that, let's remove the console log here. And then after the fetch, we're going to write dot then, and we're going to just indent that down here to see a bit more clearly what we're going to do. Then we're going to say, take this response here and console log it response res for short and just console log that response hit save now we have the response from the promise in order to read what is in this response we need to convert it because now it is in a json format and we need to convert it to a javascript format because this is javascript file so we're going to call dot json method on this result which gives us a second promise. Now we're one layer deeper and in the result here, we see that we get an array with our user names and the rest of the user data. And because this is a promise, we can use dot then again to access that further data. And instead of console logging the response from the first promise, we are going to console log the data from the second promise. When I hit save, we see that we get the array with 10 users. If I open it up, we see that we have address, email, name. So now I can start to play around with that and input that into my HTML. For example, here in my HTML, I have a paragraph with an ID of P. So instead of console logging this data when running this arrow function here, we are going to go into the document dot get element by ID. We're going to target the P and we are going to set the inner HTML of that element equals to the data. Let's see what we get. We get object, object, object. That makes sense because we need to nest further down. If we go into our networks tab here, click the users, click the preview. We see that now we're just getting the top level here, which is an array of objects. So we are going to go into the first index here. So we're going to write square brackets zero. That is giving us the first object. If we open that, we are going to use the name key dot 
name. And there we see that we have set the inner HTML of our paragraph to the name of the first user. Now this JSON placeholder API also gives us the ability to not only fetch all the users, but also to write a specific user. So if we write ID one, we get the data for only Leanne Graham. So I'm going to revert this to only console log the data, hit save. And we see that we are now only console logging all the users. And if I now change the URL and I hit slash one, we see that we only get the first user. If I say 10, I get the 10th user. If I say 11, I get an error because there are only 10 users in total in this API. And as we can see here, if we go to the network tab, we see that we have a 404, which means that something about this URL is not correct, but we still get a response. We get an empty object because this promise has been resolved, despite that this get request, the status of it gives us an error. Here is where we need to do a bit of error handling in order to avoid situations like this. So before we actually do something with our data here, console logging in this instance, we need to actually make sure that we have data first and that we don't just return an empty object. So how do we do that? If I go in here and I console log the result, we see that it has a OK key here and we see that it is set to false. If I change this 11 back to a 10, we see that the OK is true. So it has this status on the response here. So we can use that OK here to check if we have data or not, or if we're getting a 200 status code. So we're going to say if the result, if the result is not OK, we are going to throw new error. And in that error is going to say not OK. However, if it is OK, then return the result JSON. Then we can move to the data and we can console log that data. And then we can run a catch here that is going to take the errors that we have and handle it. So here we are going to console log the error and remove that one, clean it up like so. When I hit save, we see that we get our error here. If I say error warn, it's going to be a bit more clear. Anything that is going to fail here is going to be catched here and it's going to be console logged here. So the error that we throw here because the result is not OK is consoled here. So let's switch back that to one, let's say. So there is our user. Instead of console logging the data here, we can again get a hold of that P element and we can say inner HTML equals data dot name. And here we see that Leanne is displayed on our HTML. Instead of using dot then and catch, we have an alternative syntax we can use with the fetch API. And this is async await. So when using async await, we need to wrap that within a function. So we're going to say get user. And then inside of here, we're going to be essentially doing the same things, but using different syntax. Here, we're going to use something called a try catch statement. So we're going to try something the same way we do here. And if it fails, we're going to catch it. So try, and then we're going to catch any error that happens. And we are going to log that error if we get it. Here, I'm going to define a constant. I'm going to call it result. And then it's going to be the exact same thing here. We're going to fetch the data from the same URL. And then I'm going to have the same type of checking here to see if the result is OK. If it is not, I'm going to throw a new error and we're going to say not OK. Then we're going to create a new constant called that data. And we are going to say that is going to be response JSON. And then let's try to log that data. And let's also call that function down here, get user. Here we can see that the error is triggering not OK at get user because so far we don't actually have any asynchronous handling here. We are running this code, this function, as if it was a synchronous operation. So what we need to do here is we need to use the await keyword here to await the result of this fetch. So we're not going to move on to this line the next line before the fetch here has finished getting our data. And when we use await, we also need to declare this function 
as an async function that removes that warning here. And we also need to await, because we get a second promise in here, we need to await the second promise that is the result. And now when I save, we see that we get the same name here from our second function. Now, how do we actually do anything else than just getting the names? How do we, for example, create a new user? So I'm going to remove the async syntax and focus on the dot then notation. In this start, I told you that fetch takes a secondary parameter and we are going to use that now because we are going to change this request here from a get to a post. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to remove the slash one and only use the users here, then we're going to add the second optional parameter here inside of the fetch function. So it takes a object. And with this object, we're going to actually send what kind of method we want to use. So instead of the default get that we see here, we're going to say use the method of post. If I hit save, we see that we get a 201 post. So created, obviously, we are missing a couple of other things like what are we creating? We're creating a user. Okay, what does that user need? Well, we're going to send the data to that user inside of the body object. So here, I want to create a user with the name of john. Now if we see we are sending post, we see the payload is object object. So that's not really going to work for us. Here again, we have a JavaScript object that we are trying to send, but we actually need to convert this into JSON format. So we kind of have to do the reverse of what we did earlier, because now we are going from JavaScript to JSON in order for the request to be understood. So we're going to take this body object, we are going to say JSON dot stringify and parentheses around that. And now if we look at the payload, we see that it is being correctly understood by the fetch method. If we click the preview here, though, we see that we are only getting ID. So we have actually only created a new user with an ID of 11, but it's lacking a name. And that is because we're lacking another part of the optional parameter here. We need to add headers and inside of here, another object, and we need to define what kind of content type this is. And we need to say this is of the type of application slash JSON. And don't forget the comma there. And now if I save and I click this again and I go to preview, now payload shows the name and preview also includes the name. So now the new user with ID of 11 has the name of John. You're not actually updating the API here. This API is made in a way so you can mess around with it without actually altering the data, but it is going to send you the responses as if you successfully did it. What if we want to actually update a user instead of creating a new one? Well, let's say we want to update the user with the ID of eight. So we write slash eight after users. All we have to do is update the post to put. This is going to replace the entire user with the data we send in. If we save that, we see that we now have updated user with an ID of eight to have the name John. If we use patch instead, we would only be updating, as we can see here, the name John, but all the other info would stay the same. And if we want to delete a user, we just have to write the method of delete, and we don't need a body here. And then we would delete the user, we see that we return an empty object. And now when we try to put that data into our HTML, we get undefined because it doesn't exist. We're also not getting an error here because we haven't really handled this and it wouldn't really make sense to use the data of a delete request because um, we've just deleted it successfully. But instead, we could have, for example, logged here, user deleted, and then we get a confirmation like that. Now you know how to get data from an external source using the Fetch API, how to update data, change it, and delete it. I hope you liked this video. If you did, then I have another one suggested for you right here. Until next time, see ya.